this is a real common problem in uh, the velocity problems. I think that you might have a little bit of misunderstanding in kind of what the formula itself means just by the way you worded things, the way you worded your question. So let me, let me take just a quick minute and tell you what each of these pieces mean, okay? This first H in front, believe it or not, that H is standing, stands for your ending height. Where is the ball going to end at the end of this whole thing? When you throw it, is it going to end up on the ground? Is it going to end up in a tree? What height is where is it going to end? In this case, I assume you're saying that you want to know when the ball hits the ground. So we are going to put a zero there for when it hits the ground. This negative 16 has to do that, that number negative 16 has to do with gravitational pull on Earth. Um, if you went to another planet and threw a ball, you may not get the same, that, that negative 16 would change. So that has to do with the gravitational pull on Earth. So we have negative 16 d squared. Excuse my, uh, my stylus is awful here. It's not wanting to cooperate tonight. Uh, plus you've got your velocity, which you got that right, and time again. And then with the h sub zero, this little zero down here is not to the zero power. You mentioned that you thought it was h to the zero power. That zero is down, it's a subscript. And so what that zero, I tell my kids, that's a zero for, it's an O, not a zero. And it means original. So H is the original, that ending H is the original height. Where did it start? What, at what height did your ball start or your whatever you threw? Where did it start? So the first H then, the, the first H is where do you end up? The last H is where you started. So kind of get that in your, in your logic before we start this. All right, so with that in mind, so um, in this situation, uh, like I said, the ball's gonna hit the ground. That's what we, I, I assume that's what your end product is. So the ball's gonna hit the ground eventually. And we have our negative 16 T squared, which is a constant and our velocity, they were given, uh, what is it, 63 feet per second. We got a T there again. And then the starting height, it said a ball was thrown at four feet. So imagine somebody about, you know, four foot five, four foot six, throwing a ball, and they release it right about at their head, and that would be at about four feet. So the ball is released, not from the ground, but from someone's hand. So that's why we put the four there it was released at four feet. Okay, so now I've got a quadratic and it makes sense that I have a quadratic. It makes sense that I have a quadratic with a negative in front because remember your quadratics with a negative in front, it's a parabola that's upside down like this. Well, that makes sense because when you throw a ball, it's gonna go up and curve and then it's gonna come back down. So it makes sense that a negative quadratic would describe the path of a ball. Okay, so uh, to quadratic, we want to solve it uh, because, because this ball happened to be let go at four feet right here. So if this is four feet and it was let go at four feet, I want to know when did it hit the ground? So, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at where, where it hit, uh, how long till it hit the ground. So let's solve this, this uh, not solve, let's factor this quadratic. Well, I'll solve it too because I'm looking for zeros. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do, I do not like negatives in front of my squared term when I'm trying to factor. That just makes life kind of hard. So since I have an equation, I can do whatever I want to both sides as long as I do the same thing to both sides. So I'm thinking I want to get rid of that negative right there. So I'm going to multiply both sides by a negative one, which is fine as long as I do, as long as I do both. What are we doing here, buddy? as long as I do both sides by negative one. And so when I do that, then um, I, zero times negative one is still gonna be zero. So I'm still gonna have a zero over here. But over here, every value is gonna change. Now I'm gonna have a positive 16 T squared. I'm gonna have a negative 63 T and I'm gonna have a negative four. Now to be much easier to factor now that I, goodness gracious, now that I have a, um, a positive leading coefficient, it will be much easier to uh, factor. 
Um, I have a, I do have a leading coefficient. Therefore, I cannot just set up two parentheses and start factoring. I use what I call the AC method. I don't know what your teacher calls it, but this is the method I use. I call it the AC method because, you know, in a quadratic, the, the uh, standard form for a quadratic, it's AX squared plus BX plus C. And so your A is your first term, your C is your last term. And that's uh, kind of where we're going here because the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to write down my A term, which is my first term. I'm gonna write it down. I'm gonna write down my last term and I'm gonna leave the middle open. And the reason I'm gonna leave the middle open is because now I'm going to multiply those that A and that C together. And 16 times negative four happens to be a negative 64. I have my kids make a little X like this. So I want factors of negative 64 that add up to the middle term of negative 63. Well, that would need to be a negative 64 and a one. Because if you multiply negative 64 times one, you'll get negative 64. If you add negative 64 plus one, you'll get a negative 63. So in place of this negative 63 T right here, in place of that, I'm gonna put in these two factors. I'm gonna put in a negative 64 T plus a one T. Now I have four terms. And when you have four terms, you're gonna group. You're gonna put them in pairs. So I'm gonna group this one and this one. So since this is a 64T and a 16T, I can pull, I'm gonna pull a common factor out of both of these groups. So remember I still have a zero equals out here. I'm gonna pull a 16T out of that first group and that'll leave me with a T minus four. You always have to factor something out. I can always factor out a one if nothing else is, is comes out. There's no other um, factors, common factors. And if you do this correctly, it's cool because these two guys always match. So now I'm gonna pull out that common factor. So the T minus four is a common factor here. So once I've pulled those out, they're gone, and I'm left with this 16t plus one. Now I have two factors that equal zero. So one of those has to be a zero. There's no other way to get a product of zero unless one of those factors is a zero. So I'm gonna go over and I'm gonna set each of those equal to zero. Let's go over here and say T minus four equals to zero. That's one possibility. In that case, T would be four. The second possibility is the 16 T plus one. If I set that equal to zero, 16 T plus one equals zero. And if I subtract a one from both sides, I'm gonna end up with 16 T equals a negative one. And when I divide by 16, T is going to be a negative number. Time can't be negative. You can't have negative time. You can only have positive time. So therefore, this answer is not even an option, even though mathematically negative 1 16th would make it work. But in a real life situation, time cannot be negative. Therefore, the only answer I can use is the 4. So your, your final answer then is four seconds. So it takes four seconds, and that makes sense. I mean, this person must have really throw, throwing it well, 63 feet per second. That's, that's a long, that's a lot of feet. That's a, that's a big throw. Um, so the ball stayed in the air for four seconds before it hit the ground. Okay, so hope that helped. Again, this is Jenna McGinnis. I'd love to help you again. Ask for me at Wise Ant, and they'll connect us. Good night. Thank you.